ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rochelle Diamond. Inspiring ideas. That is what we are all about at the LinkedIn Speaker Series. Not only do we want to bring in ideas that are inspiring, but we hope through these sessions that we will be inspiring new ideas. LinkedIn gives us this time to step out of our day-to-day -day routine to learn and to grow. So I'm just so thrilled that there's so many of you here to take advantage of this opportunity. I'm Rochelle Diamond. I have the privilege of running our LinkedIn Speaker Series, and I want to welcome you all here today, whether you're in the room or if you're on the stream. The Speaker Series, as I mentioned before, is all about in bringing in inspiring ideas and innovative thinkers to help our members and our employees be more productive and successful. And you can see all the past events recorded at speakers.linkedin.com, and you can also check it out um, on our iTunes channel and listen to it as a podcast. So our speaker today, the namesake and founder of Charles Schwab, Chuck Schwab himself, is an, an incredible example of an innovative thinker who's been implementing inspiring ideas across the decades. Schwab, both the company and the man, were responsible for transforming the stock investing industry from one that used to be only available to Wall Street traders to one that's now open to all individual investors and now literally for no commission. His story is really fascinating wrought with trials and tribulations, both professionally and personally, over the years, as he's continued to challenge norms and conventions across decades of change. We're so fortunate today to have our own CFO, Steve Sordello, here to talk to Chuck. Did anybody get the Charles Schwab reference? Got it? Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> to talk to Chuck about his personal and his business life lessons. So with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Steve Sordello and Chuck Schwab. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, uh, there must be a lot of investors here. <laughs> looking around, looking for secrets or something, uh, inside information, maybe. OK, thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, and uh, thank you, Chuck, for Thanks. being here with us today. I, um, I, I really enjoyed this book. Um, it, it, it really resonated with me personally in a lot of ways in terms of watching someone over their art, the course of their career and, and you know, through the different ups and downs and innovating throughout. And so really appreciate Rochelle. Rochelle stole my line. Talk to Chuck. I was going to I was going to use that. That was going to be my funny line. Um, but uh, maybe just to start off, I, you know, I was thinking about uh, your path uh, when you were when you were younger in, in the book. One of the things that you talked about, you had you had several different types of jobs and um, just how they impacted you in terms of your path to what you ultimately, you know, you, you talked about learning very early that you wanted to work for yourself, with, which meant becoming an entrepreneur. So I'm just curious, how did those jobs influence your, your path? Well, in many ways, you could say, I blame it on my parents. We were in the, they were brought up in the depression years, and that's the 30s we're talking about, not more recently in the 30s, and they always, had a shortage of money. My father was a lawyer, small town lawyer, in Woodland, California, near Sacramento. And they always talked about they'd like to get this thing, but there was a shortage of money to do that with. And all my early life was about resources simply weren't available to do certain things. So little things like buying a bike when I was nine or 10, we always got the used bike, not the brand new bike. So that was sort of the my early upbringing. So I decided along the way that I have to figure out a way to improve my life because I don't want to live a life of limited resources. That made sense to me, making money. How could I do that? So I spent some time reading biographies of some famous Americans and non-Americans and how they did it. And so many gravitated towards the financial world. We didn't have the technology world then. God, I would have gone into technology, I think, like you all. 
But back then, uh, there was no internet and all those things, or barely, it wasn't even television for that matter. So I figured finance was a, part, a good way for me to go. So I did a lot of studying and uh, that in my schooling and so forth. And so that's why I gravitated towards finance and uh, did that in school, and graduate school, et cetera, and read a lot of books about it. Became an expert in it, frankly. I thought I was an expert. Always thought the market went up. It didn't. It goes down, too. <laughs> Learn that out very quickly in your, in your learnings, say the least. So anyway, that was my starting point. OK. Um, uh, another interesting area uh, as you were growing up. So one of the things that uh, a couple traits that I deem really important, I try to embed them in my two daughters, is perseverance and resilience. <clears throat> And clearly, uh, through the course of your career, there's many ups and downs where those two traits are critically important. Uh, but one thing you're, you're very open about in the book uh, when you were younger as being dyslexic. And uh, some of the, the challenges, but also uh, how that actually helped you ultimately be successful, the, the, the qualities of that. And so I just thought maybe you could well, share Steve, a little bit about the that. The whole thing about dyslexia, there's. Interesting, because I didn't really know I was dyslexic until I was in my mid-40s, because I had my son, who was then seven or eight, diagnosed in school. He was, he was having a lot of trouble in school, reading and all these things. Those were the identical the issues I faced when I was the same age. But there was no science around it, no name around it called dyslexia. That all came later in terms of medical science. And so it was a big aha moment for me in my early 40s to find out Boy, that's what I've been facing all these years. I couldn't read very fast. And as a result, in, in fact, you always have that issue. That's why we listen to books on tape and things like that to give you uh, a little assistance uh, when, it, when it's necessary. Uh, so anyway, that early kind of uncertainty about myself when I got into college, I was much slower reading than some of my friends, so many of them who took perfect notes, I'd read their notes, because uh, I was a terrible note taker in college, for instance. And I read their notes, I'd get really improved grades. Sometimes I'd get a grade better than the guy who took the notes. Uh, but once I had, was able to comprehend what it was, uh, through great note taking, I could do much better in the class. Uh, so dyslexia doesn't, is not associated with mental uh, defects. It's just a processing of code to meaning uh, and, and back and forth. It's this phonological issue that uh, actually it turns out, as I found out later in my approach to this and helping other people, with something like one in seven children have some touch on learning issues. One in seven is a huge number. And it turns out, uh, in, when you look at the research, that. In prisons, our prisons are about 50% of the people that are in prison have come with a problem, a learning issue problem. It's amazing to see the consequences of not attending to the issues of people who have that kind of thing. And anyway, it's, it leads to stigmas and all kinds of things you can well imagine when you find out you do have it. It sounds like, um, at least in reading the book, when you, when you look back on it, uh, it, it kind of put you in a position where you you had, to, you had to work harder, but you also learned to listen. Yeah, well, that was one people. of the things, see, that really, I think, as I look, reflect back upon my career, that I was able to, and I, it was necessary for me to surround myself with really bright people and not be, and always appreciate their contributions along the way and make sure that we had a common purpose where we're going. But I had experts around me. I sort of knew the bigger vision. Uh, that's a little bit of the advantage of some dyslexics uh, were sort of that way, and but the purpose of what we were about, about but I had people surrounding great CFO next to me and another HR person over here and somebody else over here, a technology person. But we all, as a team, went forward and made it really happen. Um, so the entrepreneur side, um, in the book you mentioned, before starting Schwab in the early 70s, there were other startups that you tried that, that actually didn't work out. Um, I'm wondering, what were any learnings from those that helped you make, took to Schwab when you launched Schwab? Right. 
<clears throat> well, they were sort of investment type things. I was encouraged some other people along the way. We had different projects. And most of them did not work out. Uh, I guess you learn from your defeats, um, what not to do again, of course. Uh, but also, I guess what you see also is the persistence of my, my, my way of thinking that I had to figure out a better way to do what I was doing. And, and I think uh, perseverance is a really a, a good feature to have in one's mind. Don't give up. <laughs> what, what made you... Um think that you could take on an entrenched industry. I, you know, I think this is, this is an industry that is, has embedded conflicts of interest um, that are not necessarily good for the investor. Um, there's an aspect to it where you're, you, you obviously weren't a friend. Yeah, what Steve's talking about, <clears throat> when I first got into the business, I got out of Stanford Business School way back when. In my first job, my job while I was in business school, I worked at nights and weekends because didn't have a whole lot of money, as I mentioned. Uh, so I needed a job also while I was going to school. And uh, what I found out dealing, uh, I was a securities analyst or budding B securities analyst. I worked for the small advisory company in Menlo Park. And we had brokers, traditional brokers calling us all the time. And I kept really good notes about their stories. They're all stories. And uh, I usually talk about, well, jump on that story and you get a quick rocket to the moon, you know, because that thing that go up in value and you better hop on. Uh, what I found out, a lot of these stories were based upon really false premises and were just phony things to get me or our investing people to buy into stocks that had big commissions involved in the thing, big payouts to the broker. So it was a huge conflict of interest. This, The industry was sort of built upon this strange conflict of interest. The higher the commission earned by the broker, usually the higher the risk was for me. I thought that was a terrible situation. And so when I started our company in really 1973, I tried to take that all out. I said, our people are only going to be compensated by a salary plus a bonus based upon the success of the company. Nothing to do with the commissions. So we took out that conflict remained that way for the next 40 years, 50 years, whatever it's been. And uh, it's been one of the keystones, I think, of our company in terms of how we've been able to win millions and millions of customers coming to us, leaving traditional firms, because they get sort of a safe haven in doing business with us. How, I'm curious, how important do you believe uh, was, you, you, were, you were a very different approach. Uh, you, you know, most of the competition was East Coast, uh, you were here in the West Coast, a little bit more entrepreneurial yeah. environment. How, how important was the environment? I, I think it was, of... we were really lucky, Steve, to have started the business in San Francisco with one office. And I had many friends who were in technology. It was just beginning technology. Just Silicon Valley was just beginning to really flourish, and things were happening. It was, as I said, way before Internet. Uh, but anyway, technology was... The, I adopted it very early on and was able to become very efficient early on, earlier than Wall Street. But Wall Street had old ways of doing the things they'd been doing for 200 years. They had fixed rates for 200 years. I'm out here, this little firm in the West Coast, I could adopt anything new to make us more efficient. Any new technology way to make processing much more quickly. And uh, as I said, we had people who took orders got paid on salary, uh, no, no commissions involved. And I think also the fact that we were on the West Coast, we had longer hours. Markets would close at 1 o'clock New York time. We had all afternoon to sort of clean up the paperwork that was there at the very beginning. That was very beneficial. And I think we had a thought process here on the West Coast at the time. You know, sort of anything goes. we got to figure out something that hasn't been done before. Well, let's try it. We had that entrepreneurial kind of, let's try it and see if it works. See if the customer likes it. If the customer doesn't like it, we'll trash it. If they do like it, man, we'll just add more of it. Um, in terms of, again, on the entrepreneur side, uh, one of our values is uh, taking intelligent risks. And 
you know, listening to your story, um, learning about the background, even your parents coming out of the Depression and, and their view on risk, um, I was struck in, in the book by your, I don't know if it was, it wasn't, you understand leverage, but you have a, 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 a desire not to have Deep that. respect for leverage, let me tell you. <laughs> but that's the one way you're going to lose your company or yeah, lose so anything the, you do. the debt side of it. Oh, man. And how do you think about, obviously, investing takes risks, um, but also you, as an entrepreneur, you want to make sure you can control your own destiny. And this idea of debt as being an albatross in a way, and well, how you manage that. I think the one way to, to uh, handle risk is really know a lot about the subject. And in my case, I really tried to learn as much as I possibly could about the investing business, all the various ways that <clears throat> one could lose money um, and so forth. And so I tried to mitigate that as much as possible all the way through. There were still some areas that I didn't know exactly what, and we talk about in the book, it was the crash of 87. And uh, we had some customers who, <clears throat> one in particular, that borrowed a lot of money. And he was uh, actually, he was, he was doing naked puts in a down market. Uh, that's a real loser, because puts go up in value, and he had sold them short. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, it's an interesting story to find out how we learned about one risk that we didn't see and now, <clears throat> obviously, we've uh, mitigated that, too. Um, so another one of our values, I'm going to transition a little bit here, uh, is a member's first orientation. It's actually our number one value as a company. And you very much set up tr the Charles Schwab organization as an investor first company. Same thing. And Whether you're a member or you're an investor or a client, same thing. And uh, a lot of the way you ran the company was looking at what you wanted as an investor, right. your, your own. And so how did, how did you embed that in the culture of the company? Well, it was that idea of investor first. relatively, I guess you'd say, easy. I mean, from the very beginning, we wanted to look through the prism of the customer. What was the benefit for the customer first? Wall Street had you know, zillions of years of tradition can we make money on selling that product? That first determinant of that, can we make money on it? I always look at it the other way around. What does the, what does the customer really like to have? Forget about the money making. If the, we get enough customers that really like something, we'll figure out a way to make money. So that was always, we reversed the whole process. And you also talk uh, very much about the importance of, of a, an aligned mission and a purpose-driven company. Oh, yeah. Well, it's pretty simple in our case. Uh, we know our customers, our clients, as we call them, want to have a best of outcomes, meaning they want wealth creation uh, in their early years of investing. In their later years of investing, they want to have maximize income. They want to maximize safety. They want to maximize a lot of things and take less risk as they go through their cycle of, of aging and so forth. Uh, so... We try to accommodate whatever level they are in terms of their life cycle. The, um, can you talk a little about May Day? About what? May Day. May Day, oh yeah, May Day. <clears throat> uh, May Day for us was May 1 of 1975, and that was the day that <clears throat> was established that Congress had mandated that fixed rates would be eliminated, that from there on out, Rates, commission rates would be negotiated. Well, it's interesting. Wall Street had somehow or other been able to construct for 200 years fixed rates. So every broker you went to charged the same rate. Well, that's crazy, as you can well imagine in today's world. Uh, but that's so May 1 of 75 is when they altered that rule. So for us, it was a very big day. I think I might have had 10 employees at the time. And uh, that day, Merrill Lynch, strangely enough, raised the rates. We went down 75%. So it left a huge gap for us to step into and offer. We started advertising quite a bit then. For us, it was quite a bit. Was teeny little ads, but it was quite a bit for us. We didn't have a lot of money. And so, but customers started coming in, coming in. And our ads got bigger and bigger and bigger as more customers kept coming in. It was a lot of fun. 
<laughs> when you think about, um, you know, a lot of the, the struggles of companies are trying to uh, achieve long-term results, navigating short-term. And um, the customer experience, uh, serving the customer ideally over the long term pays off. But many times in the short term, there are trade offs. And I, I imagine over the cycle, whether you know, it's areas like reducing your price so much that right. you're, you know, how did you navigate that long term, short term uh, from a customer perspective? Like trying to do the right thing, but navigating well, short term trade offs. In our case, uh you know, the, many of the things were learnings along the way. Um, I mean, th things like you would never imagine would be possible at that time because the industry, in some ways, was an opportunity for us. For instance, there was a big election in 1980. And I decided, to hell, most brokerage firms, most banks had, you know, they're open five hours a day for five days a week. And on that day, I decided to keep the business open all night long. As the results came in, it was a Reagan landslide at that time, 1980. And it was a great thing for the business community because he was very much about free markets and all this stuff. And we had enormous orders pour in that night. Well, why not be open every night? Why not be open? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of an obvious kind of thing to happen. Well, sure enough, we started took us gradually over you know, the next year or so to go from um, you know, weekends open and on nights open and so forth. So, of course, now we're 24-7. But no one ever thought of that back then. Took one little experiment. So we, lots of those things came along the way that sort of, aha, is that customers really like that. They like to do their stuff on Sunday afternoon. You know, they've got to work all day or you know, LinkedIn, and they go back home, and they do their trading later. <laughs> Understand. Uh, another aspect of what we talked about, entrepreneurship, and then there's innovation. And uh, your organization has always been on the leading edge, uh, whether, obviously, the industry as a whole in terms of what you did, but computerized trading or opening branch offices. Um, how, did you, how did you think about these next great leaps or next best things in terms of it continuing to innovate? Yeah. See, I don't think we ever had fear of lowering our rates, make less money on the thing. If we lower our rates along the way, more people would use it. And, uh, and what, whatever the service might have been, maybe trades, but some other things that we did also. For instance, mutual funds was a big thing back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we were the first to offer a mutual fund marketplace. We took the fees off of mutual funds. We offered only no load from a variety of families of funds. You could use Fidelity, Vanguard, whoever you want, and be no fee. We figured that out. We went back to the companies, said, give us a little piece of your management fee. We'll offer your services completely free to anybody in the world. And so it became extraordinarily popular. Other firms like Fidelity copied us. I think a lot of people ended up copying. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. Uh, you know, uh, my career is is shorter than yours so far, but I've been through many cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think there's a couple two part question. One is the learnings of going through, uh, you know, the crash of '87, the dot com crash, the financial crisis in '08. Um, some of those learnings, and then on the flip side, I think some people don't often realize that success breeds challenges too, um, especially when you're fast growing in need of capital. And so, I, I'm, you know, there were takeaways in the book related to your IPO, related to some learnings of overextending before the dot com. Uh, I'm just curious on both both those fronts. I'd love to get your perspective. Well, generally speaking, you have to say. No one can really predict tomorrow. Stock market, commodity market, how many customers you're going to have. You're always working as hard as you possibly can. And growth in, in America has always been sort of ups and downs, and our emotions sort of goes up and down. We have different issues out there. So, but underneath, underlying our great economy and the entrepreneurial 
part of our economy that really grows and adds new ideas and so forth is always sort of always sort of growing. Now there are times when we go sideways. Hardly ever does it ever go down much. It's always waiting for the next wave up. And you have to have some faith and belief in that, that the way we are structured, because one would say, and I'll say this, maybe, it, maybe it's a little bit partial to say the least, you know, there's a struggle right now between the word capitalism and socialism. Well, to me, capitalism is what the heart and soul of America is because capital means, it comes from the Latin word caput, which is an interesting way to pronounce it. It could be pronounced, it means head. Capitalism is about the head. What comes from the human ingenuity and creativity, all the things that come from the brain, we change, we evolve, we grow, and all those things. Socialism is about being static. Everybody drives the same car. Everybody has the same pair of Levi's on. I guess maybe, well, maybe not. <laughs> uh, but that's what we all love. That's why you all work here at LinkedIn. You want to have innovation. You want to have creativity. You want to be known for what you have up here. And that's what our world of America and free enterprise is all about. And that's what, so your perspective, and I, it can come across very clearly uh, that you have a, a very optimistic view. You have to be optimistic, too. Yeah. Because <laughs> there will be times things are down, yeah. uh, like the crash of 87 you mentioned, and, and I and, and my employees, everyone was sort of depressed about the prices of stocks went down and all that stuff. But it was, it was relatively short term. It was like a year, year and a half that things were really depressing. And all of a sudden, turn around, boom, we went on to new highs, new innovation, new things came up that made world exciting. Yeah. yeah, so it's this this idea of innovation, creativity over time, mm -hmm. um, and patience are, are, are requirements and, for the market. And yeah. growth does take time, as yeah. you all know. I mean, you as a CFO, you set your plan for the year, and some months things are just not growing as much as you'd like, so you might adjust things to uh, make that even better next month. So related, uh, my favorite Actually, my favorite course in, in college was behavioral finance. And yeah. um, your, your behavioral philosophy, finance, that's different than numbers. And right. Your, your philosophy, um, so many times as investors, uh, you, I think you mentioned the book, Fight or Flight Syndrome, people, will, emotions will take over at the wrong time. And I would just, your, your perspective on, uh, advice on maybe countering that, that human instinct uh, as best possible, which is I, a natural I instinct. think, Steve, it's just a matter of knowledge. Look at the movement of the stock market since, you know, 100 years ago. And you can see it's very definite. You, know, you don't know the exact time of these cycles, but there are definite cycles. And guess what? They seem to always get to another high point. Then they go down, some go down more precipitously than otherwise, but in the long run, it sort of goes up. And it's not because of some mysterious thing, mystery thing, it's because of the power of us human beings working together, creating improvements every year for the humankind. That's what it's all about. So, um... I have to ask this question. So we we've, we've been on a nice bull run uh, in terms of the market. Uh, you've <laughs> What's been you've been tomorrow? you've been through cycles uh, where you know at times I think you you, uh, you the dot com I think there was a, a, a general sense that valuations had got out of whack before the 08. There were other signals. I'm curious your perspective on the market today. I frankly believe that um, the recent tax bill was extraordinarily beneficial for corporate America. Our cash flows of all the companies, and probably including yours, is substantially higher than it was before because tax rates have gone from, in our case, 38% down to essentially 24. So we're able to plan ahead and put more money into new offices for us, uh, new software for us, new capabilities for our clients. That's all fantastic. And I'm sure you guys are doing the same thing also. And you just have more liquidity available to do that. 
So it, it really generates the new jobs, the new uh, customer benefits along the way. And I, so I'm very, I'm still extraordinarily optimistic, as I you mentioned. Uh, you have to be. Uh, there could be an outside event, but I think the outside event might be a more positive event if the, some of these trade issues get solved, or at least uh, the first or second phase. I think there'll be some interesting new opportunities. I know for us there will be. Um, so I'm, I'm clearly uh, staying on the optimistic side. And you, you can see just in the last year, all the, the newspaper articles, I mean, how they, you know, we have the politics issue. and But the, there was always, it seemed like to me, the press was trying to create a recession. They couldn't help themselves. <laughs> And they kept saying, it's going to happen. The market's going to go down. It, well, guess what? Look at today. It's another new high because of anticipation, I think, of some trade issues being resolved, at least the first phase. So uh, you just have to, in terms of behavioral science, have internal confidence. And if you have a stock and it goes down a little bit, that can be off, you know, the volatility there is pretty important. Make sure you're diversified. There's not only one stock in the world, and I tell our people, there's not just Schwab alone at our company. You have to be a little diversification to reduce your risk. Um, I, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, and then I'm going to allow um, members of the audience and stream to, to ask oh, yeah. some questions. Mm -hmm. um, one is uh, related to where you are today and your philanthropic and your, oh. your, your kind of belief in back, you know, giving back, particularly in areas that... Uh, had an impact on you or you've had an impact? And maybe you could talk a little about how you tie back to philanthropy. Well, fundamentally, I believe uh, that those of us who've been highly s successful in financial terms have a real obligation to give back. I mean, we're, that's what life's all about. Uh, if we're lucky enough to be leaders in whatever it might be and maybe financial success. So I, my, in terms of uh, philanthropy, Topic efforts. I have uh, focused early on uh, through education, and we do for the university and the schools I went to. That was obviously, but I, I, another area that's really important to me is now the kids at lower level who don't have the same opportunity that may, many of you had. And so we've put a lot of money, my wife, on, into charter schools. Uh, it's a real opportunity for kids in not such great circumstances to really get an improvement in their education at the beginning. Uh, that's really important to me. Uh, other, of course, medical science, all that kind of stuff. Also, we have a keen interest in art. Um, so one of the big things, I was chairman of the museum in San Francisco, Art Museum. But I always thought art is one of the greatest cultural things that humans have. It starts the caves many, many years ago, right on to... But the creativity of artists, sometimes through their ability to sort of describe what they're painting, although sometimes you don't even know what they're painting, but they're trying to solve issues many times. It could be social issues. It could be, I don't know, whatever it might be. But the creativity of artists, and I've always taken that as something I could take internally. Let's not let any limits beyond my thinking in terms of what could come next. And I think you can get a lot from artists in terms. So I've been a big fan of contemporary art and so forth. And uh, I'll stop there. And you also, you also believe strongly that we should teach financial management. Oh, financial earlier. literacy. You have a course at Stanford. Financial literacy is just pathetic. You cannot find it. <laughs> I mean, really, you can't find it in high schools. Yeah. You can barely find it in a college. Uh, and so all these young people coming along, uh, uh, you know, friends of mine, children and grandchildren and so forth. So anyway, one of the things, uh, the, actually the book, and if we make any profit, of the, the money goes into financial literacy. Or, but one of my first programs at Stanford, I don't know how many of you went to Stanford, uh, but next uh, spring, there'll be a four unit course in a course called Introduction to financial decisions. And I hope if you know anybody in school, have them take it. It should be Mike Boston is going to teach that. If it's successful, I want to take that uh, syllabus as such and hopefully take it to other universities. Because I think kids need to have an understanding when they get out of school, start the first paycheck, what do I do? 401k, IRA, you know, what do I, credit cards, 
how do I put it all together? Long-term investing, what's that all about, et cetera? Yeah, we, we, so we have on LinkedIn, we have a learning mm -hmm. a platform. It would be awesome if you would teach on that. <laughs> we can distribute it to everybody in the world. So that would be, maybe, maybe, we, maybe we can make that happen. Uh, one more question before the audience. I just, I just want to, as you look back, greatest success and, and greatest regret. And then we'll, we'll start. Do, do I say that again? Your, your, what you feel is your greatest success when you look back and your, your biggest regret. Well, he actually gave that question. I and mean, I thought about the long run. Yes, I would like to say it was Schwab. That was really important. But actually what happened in a three years period of time, I raised $670 million dollars to build a brand new museum of contemporary art in San Francisco. I hope you all come up and see it. But I got volunteers, I got people to contribute. I was wore, wore out my knees, playing, asking for people for pledges. <laughs> well, anybody around here. But anyway, we raised 670 million, half for the building and half for endowment. And that was a great achievement in three years with only volunteers. No, I didn't pay anybody. That's awesome. All right, do we have any uh, questions from the audience? I think we answered everything, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> we do have some from the stream I can start with, and then if in the room you have questions, please feel and free And speak to up line loudly up. if you can, because <clears throat> yes. it's hard to hear up here. Okay, so if you were starting out again right now, what would you tell yourself to do differently with everything that you know now? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think you might have had a hint on that one in the other room. If I were starting over today and knowing everything I, hopefully I know, I would have started out with zero commissions, just like we did. You know, I would have been, uh, I always had a great love for what Google did in terms of search. Give everyone search free, and guess what? They do pretty well otherwise along the way. Very profitable company. I would like to have given commissions free early on. That would have been so dramatic. That couldn't have happened. But anyway, we started just a few weeks ago. Better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is, what, what do you define today's market? Do you think it's the side way, like your, the definition you just shared with us? Or we're still doing very well? Can you repeat that? It's, it was what, how do you define today's stock market? How do you define today's stock market? Yeah. Well, you know, today's stock market is represented by all the great companies and the valuations. And uh, America, uh, fortunately for all of us, is the leading economic power in the world. Uh, yes, China is coming along very strongly, as we all know. And we all love competition and so forth, and we want to have friendly competition because out of that comes innovation and improvements for all of us in our lives, new ideas and so forth. Um, so the stock market today uh, you know, is, is a representation of all that and uh, in terms of valuation. And what it is today, you know, 20 years from today, it could be double. You just have to be patient. And, and think about long term, you're not going to retire for another 20 years, are you? So just put your money in the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, a follow-up question was the China-US trade war and UK departure um, EU. What is the one advice you can give us as uh, investors? Uh, so the, um, the trade war and what's going on in the EU right now with like Brexit, what, what advice can you give as investors? Well, I think the trade war is a, it's just a small time period in investing, and that will be resolved. I think it's of everyone's interest to basically, if we can get to no trade barriers at all, should that should happen. We, you know, there's certain things about China uh, is slightly different than America. It's basically led by a communist party. And they have lots of ways, uh, they have a magnificent way of improving the economy there for sure. Uh, letting the entrepreneurs go crazy and they supported that and they've obviously done extremely well. I think going forward, um, the difference between our free enterprise here is our government doesn't control businesses 
like they do in China. So how, how do you blend those things together? Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, exactly, but um, I know we've been in Hong Kong for a long time and always wanted to go into mainland China, but I was not about ready to give my IP up to uh, any subsidiary that I had to give an interest in to a Chinese military person or something like that. So hopefully those rules will go away and we'll enter into China ourselves. We've been on the borders of China, Hong Kong, well, we still call it the border, I guess. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen there? <laughs> Maybe part of <laughs> before long. Uh, so I don't know, that's, um, but I'm continuing to be optimistic about the world economy. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you a question about actually like uh, maybe your competitor, Vanguard? Because Vanguard, like they have a business model as like, uh, they are saying they basically has the member as, uh, you know, the owner of the company, put it another way, they run at cost. Do you see this as a, like, a, you know, like a real force, like a kind of like a claim? Or do you feel this will be a, like a competitor or really like a, more advanced, like a hard, like a, a business model for you, for you or for other like companies to compete. Gosh, you gotta help me. So with the um, it is hard to hear. Pierre. So the uh, I think the the question was around Vanguard. Look, when you get a little older, you get a little bit harder hearing at times. I, it's my problem. Sorry about that. But uh, so it was. It was about it's Van, an age issue. It was about Vanguard as a competitor. Yeah, and, and some uh, of the things we love Vanguard. Uh, Vanguard. <laughs> well. They're, uh, they're not really, a, 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 they're a owned by their own shareholders. They have no shareholders. They're owned by their own. So if you own Vanguard shares and they want to put a new computer center in, they take a little money out of your, uh, your mutual fund account. That's how they do that. But they don't have any equity as such in the company. Uh, so it's a non-for-profit enterprise. And, uh, but they don't have all the same service. They, I think they have one branch maybe in... Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, we have 350, so you can go to any branch all around. So you have to have, I think, to be really successful, you gotta have a combination of, of both internet service and all that stuff, but also personal service. And so you can go down to the Sunnyvale office or wherever and see somebody, and that's what we find. Most people come in to our offices first to see, they look around and say, well, uh, there's some real people here. I'm about ready to give them a check for $10,000. I want to see, I want to be able to come back there and make sure I can get it back too. <laughs> and so we do a combination. And so most people do their business with us internet wise. Uh, Vanguard's a fantastic place, if cheap, 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 but we're, in many cases, we're cheaper than them also. So you have to look and make some comparative shopping. Okay. One, of, one of the things that um, I think differentiated Schwab in terms of how you think that ties to LinkedIn is that relationships matter oh boy. in terms of, you, you know, being able to turn to some, even, even your personification as the face of the company, um, it's that important relationship. Yeah, as we, it, see, we made that decision in 2004. We had for, you know, 20 years, of, we were just going about being just a transaction only kind of company. And then we fell on some bad times, the crash of 2001, essentially the dot-com thing. And I, myself and a couple of the people said, we've got to, the only way we're going to get out of this is become combined transaction capability with personal relationship. So we really went on a terror on adding that as a capability. And so that's why I think today we are one of the largest in the business because we made that transition. It was not an easy one to make, but we had to make the investment proper to do that. And so I think today we have the right combination of personal service and efficient service. Charles, um, you talked about uh, commission-free trading, and I was curious, considering the state of the financial literacy, uh, what, do you, what is your take on the opinion that this could lead to reckless investment behavior on the part of investors? So, oh, so the question was, um, given the this, this state of financial literacy, mm -hmm. what, what is the risk of reckless investing? Like people... Uh, it's a very high risk. Of, and yeah, I think um, people who don't have some background in it, they're, they're 
They're um, vulnerable to bad salesmen, uh, for sure, to they have a little bit of money and a little bit of savings, so they're highly vulnerable to whatever comes down the pathway. And so getting financial literate, there's plenty of information out there. It's online, it's in the libraries, and so forth. Um, so I would just recommend to any of you to get some of the really elementary understandings about asset allocation and and mutual funds or stocks and diversification. Just get those simple notions down. What does that all mean? And how do you do it? How do you do it inexpensively? Or you could go into a Schwab office. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll take care of everything for you. Thanks, Charles. Hi, Chuck. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm a former Schwabie. Ah, I, uh, good to see you I again. I spent a wonderful eight years after undergrad starting in 99. Uh, LinkedIn is a great fit for me because the company values that were stressed during my time at Schwab, being customer centric and acting as an owner, resonated well and built a foundation for my success here. Um, my last position was in Mark Reapy's group in Schwab Center for Investment Research. And um, uh, Schwab has always been customer focused and trying to reach the self-directed investor. How has the self-director, uh, self-directed investor preferences and trading uh, preferences has changed over the years? Well, early on, as I mentioned, we were only focused on the very self-directed investor, the transact, the person who just wants a simple transaction, and that's all. But we find that. 90, 95% of people really have other things in mind. They have, what should I do with my 401k? Should I do an IRA uh, account? Should I do a keyhole, or, or a, not a keyhole, but uh, some other form of investing? Should I do an HSA, uh, health savings account? Lots of questions, lots of opportunities to get confused for sure. And so we find people generally want to have some help along the way. Yes, they're very independent. They want to do their own password changes and so forth, but they really need some help at the very beginning of whatever they're thinking about. And so today we have, I think, a really a fine combination. Hi, thanks for visiting with us, Chuck. Um, my question is around, I've always been struck by the the quality of the customer service and that intense, you know, personal service that you talk Thank about. You. How how did you instill that in the culture, and how have you been able to maintain it? Well, I think it starts with the compensation system. People tend to do what they're paid to do. Uh, that's a really a pretty profound thing to say, huh? <laughs> but it's true. Uh, if you are, if you're. Uh, paid on a commission basis, you don't waste a lot of time on someone who's asking stupid questions and has no money. So our people, as I said earlier, are paid on salary and they're based upon, a lot of their bonuses are based upon how happy our customers are with that particular office or that particular <clears throat> agency at Schwab. And so we measure that all the time. Uh, customer satisfaction. And so that's a big <clears throat> part of the compensation formula. And so I think that's a starting point for sure. And then we reward people for a great service and we have you know, meetings uh, once or twice a year where we acknowledge people who really do outstanding uh, customer service and uh, people sort of in the culture sort of, oh, that's what you really want. Not necessarily about really hitting somebody for a big commission because we don't charge those anymore anyhow. <clears throat> so anyway, that's what we do. So my question is about uh, exchange traded funds or broad market uh, um, funds. How do, how do you feel like these uh, like S&P 500 funds are kind of distorting the market dynamics nowadays? Uh, I wasn't quite sure of the question, but I, I know about funds, and we have a lot, a lot of mutual funds at Schwab, but I'm particularly proud of one that competes with the S&P 500 fund. Uh, it's called the Schwab 1000 fund. I started in 1991, 
So we've had now 27, eight years of experience. It's a thousand companies, America's best companies are in it, and, and it's uh, equal weighted by capitalization. And it changes every year. If you fall out of it, your company stock goes down, another one comes up, we top, take the 1,000 every year going forward. And the, the uh, results have been unbelievable. It's been about 10% per annum compounded. Get your ruler out, your slide rule, or your calculator, and put it in you know, 29 to the, uh, the or I should 10 to the 10th, 29th power. It has been amazing to see the results compounding. And the S&P is pretty much the same thing. So it's, it's our version of it. And I, I love the S&P 500 too. I own it too, as well as the Schwab 1000. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, add to those, what an incredible way to invest. Massive diversification, low, low costs. Uh, just, it's just so simple to do that. So I would even buy it in an ETF form, which the Schwab 1000 ETF form also, as well as, as the S&P 500. I, I also hold that, uh, oh, good. <laughs> that good. ETF from Schwab. Is my uh, so my question is slightly related in that it seems that um, there's a bit of a rise of the index fund investing. And especially for the more uh, narrower set, like in the S&P 500, it tends to concentrate capital in this limited set of companies. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on uh, concentrating capital this way without actually having a reason to think that these companies are going to continue to grow versus other stocks that might have a potential for growth? Well, that's a, <clears throat> a debate that people are giving sort of the, as more people use indexing as to their way of investing, what will happen? Is there price discovery and proper uh, valuations going on of the people that are, the companies that are not in the 500 or not in the 1,000? Uh, I think the world is very aware. Many eyes are always looking at different stocks. If there's a stock that is definitely showing undervalue valuation, a lot of people will find it and go for it. So I'm not too worried about price discovery or too much invested in an index fund. I, I'm just not there yet. Thanks. Uh, hi, it's so great to have you here and really appreciate you connecting your own story personally you. to your professional story. Um, I also really appreciated you bringing up this kind of fever pitch tension right now, which is the debate between socialism and capitalism. I think it's really important and I really appreciated that you brought up the historical piece of that as well. Um, and certainly capitalism and the free market were very important at the founding of the United States and in the Enlightenment. Um, I think another question, and I'm wondering if we could reframe, if there's the possibility even still to reframe with such the fever pitch in the debate you're talking about, is around, is there a legitimate role for the government to play, for a democratically elected government to play in the regulation of the free market or in serving as a check on the free market? And I think there's historical precedent for that, too, if you look at something like Thomas Paine and agrarian justice at the same time that Adam Smith was writing about capitalism. Well, you know, as the, our country gets bigger and more sophisticated economically, we do have to take care of social issues along the way. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of somehow figuring out, and I have a good idea on how to do student loans. I think it's ridiculous that we have a trillion and a half dollars in student loans that some people will never be able to repay. It's, it's absurd. And it holds back so many young people from making life's decisions along the way. Uh, there should be better policy around this stuff. And uh, there's many other areas, too, that I would figure out. Uh, but you know, you got this Congress, and you got House, and Senate, and President, and all this stuff. And it's very difficult to get things done. And that may be the most difficult thing for us as society, getting things done. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, yes, government does have a, a, a place to play. And, and we need it. We, this infrastructure out here on the West Coast is terrible. Why are we doing something about our infrastructure? 
Uh, we got you know, great growing companies based upon great ideas, and our infrastructure is 30, 50 years behind. I mean, right here in our back doors. Really sad. Uh, anyway, <laughs> get, get me wound up on this one. I'll be. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I hope that we can keep reframing conversations like that to find common ground. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Hi, Chuck. Thank you for visiting with us. And thank you, LinkedIn, for hosting speaker series. Uh, my question is about, uh, do you have any recommended or favorite resources for people who want to learn more about personal finance? About uh, any recommended resources for people who want to learn more about personal finance? Well, there are a lot of fine books. Just go into Amazon, put up the word, you know, <laughs> or, or talk to Siri say, I want to learn about finance. Uh. <laughs> Man, you will be there all day. Uh, use modern technology to get there. I mean, they're all over the, it depends on your level of sophistication, but there's some very primitive books that can get you begin and then get more sophisticated to go along. But uh, we, Schwab, has an online capability. Uh, go into our website. There's a thing on uh, money, uh, money, talks or something like that, I forget what the name is. But we have a lot, and other firms have ways to get educated. Ours is a lot of pictorial stuff. It'll, I think we haven't had one we have to go through, and it's almost a course. So I would recommend that too. I was just wondering if you had like any favorites. I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, we have it. I just don't know exactly the website, I mean the URL to get you there. Thank you. So I know you mentioned May Day as a very important point in Schwab's history. I'd love to hear from you what, if you can think of any day, kind of personally or professionally, in your life, oh. what would be your favorite day? <laughs> well, how about yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> yesterday I played in the Schwab Cup. <laughs> Uh, it was a championship cup in Phoenix where we have the senior players. They work all year long. And I played yesterday in the pro-am portion of the thing. And I shot a 78, which was four shots under my age. I had a great <laughs> day, let me tell you. Since we have two minutes, or a couple minutes, um, and this ties to that question, this was from the stream, um, that you are known for your love of golf, so would love to ask why, and like how has that, or how that came about, and how has it shaped your career, um, and how shaped how you lead? Well, golf, golf's a big, big subject to me, because it does have a lot of relationship to my life. Um, it, uh, it's sort of what, how I got into Stanford, because I was a pretty good golfer, uh, that sort of was a good beginning. Uh, it has, uh, you know, a lot of, if you're, I don't, probably very few golfers in this room, but uh, it has a lot of things in relationship to life. There's an association with the more practice you put into golf, the better golfer you're going to be. Now, that's a strange notion. More <laughs> practice means better golfing. Uh, things like there are rules and regulations. Life has rules and regulations. You hit out of bounds, it's a two-shot penalty. You come back in, but it's okay, your life moves on. You can make mistakes, you know, and then you try to do better. I mean, there's goes on and on, the relationship between golf and so forth. But fundamentally, it's a great game, and it's a wonderful way to get some exercise. Um, <clears throat> we're up on the hour. Um, I had one more question. Uh, that I thought I'd ask is, what, uh, what do you hope people take away from the book? Well, I wrote the book originally and uh, for my employees. I wanted them to really, really uh, inculcate their, our values, what our company stands for and how we got there. It didn't happen overnight. It took a long time to do that. But the fundamental values are hopefully are really resilient and will be there 100 years from now. Different than Wall Street. You'll never see another company on Wall Street ever created like this one, uh, in my view. Um, so, and then I thought also for my clients that if they read that, they would understand 
their relationship with us and hopefully that, that relationship would be just like that will always be and they can feel uh, the sense of integrity there and the sense of loyalty and a sense of trust. So those are my first uh, objectives in this thing and then hopefully others would, it's a fun entrepreneurial story over a number of years, many ups and many downs. But that's also highly important, I think, for all of you, is to have your careers will move along, and there'll be maybe not as big a swing as I might have had, but you're gonna have little bumps along the way. Resiliency, commitment, all those things are highly valuable, and they will work out. And I hope they all work out for all of you. Well, one of, uh one of the cultural tenets of the company is about transformation. And I, I wanted to thank Chuck uh, for coming today. Um, it's really a story of, of industry transformation. The company continues to transform and reinvent itself. And, and the transformation of, of your career was just a wonderful story and uh, really, really great to learn from you Thanks, today. Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck, Thanks for coming. You.